I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Latin America. Today, we're going to be talking about what you need to actually be talking to your employer about when you're looking at moving into moving abroad, working as a digital nomad, just doing things as an expat for employment when you're already working from home or going to be working from home. This can be a little bit complex because people have a tendency to layer on some things that they are not actually accurate about or are not thinking about the context of how they're using them and they can lead themselves into a position where they end up not being able to work from home when they were actually allowed to simply through a lot of confusion or oversharing. So we're going to talk about that because it came up in a discussion this morning. And I also want to say we just started a new playlist for people who are interested in what it's like to work abroad, digital nomadry, um, being able to handle taxes, looking at working remotely from Nicaragua, looking at working remotely as an American working abroad, how taxes are going to play in. We have some specific information because I'm an American who works from Nicaragua, but we'll do our best to, to uh, collect other information. But there is a playlist now, so you can go into that and see a collection of our information about factors for working remotely uh, when you are an expat. I think that'll be very useful for a lot of people. So I don't know why we never had that collected before, but it's now available as a playlist, and we're going to get to today's topic right after the bump. It's a common story you hear all the time from people who are currently working from home. They go and talk to their employer and say, I want to work from Nicaragua. And their employer says, well, I know you can work from home, but Nicaragua can't be your home. You're not able to do that. We're not able to have people work from outside the United States. And there are circumstances where this statement would be true, primarily defense contractors. If you're working for a super high security portion of the American military infrastructure, it is assumed that you absolutely have to work from uh, the United States. And that is totally reasonable. Pretty much every country is going to have certain roles that are like that. Uh, but there are many roles that are not. Key notable one in the United States, for example, the President of the United States does not have to be in the United States. They're able to work from anywhere and they do all the time. The President visits other countries and still works from there. It is a completely normal thing. It is expected and you couldn't effectively be President if you didn't travel to other countries at least part of the time. So clearly the top most secure role or most security conscious role in the country still can work from abroad. That doesn't mean we're saying that it isn't fair for defense contractors to have certain positions that can't travel abroad. You can't have the kind of security detail with those people that you can with the president. It all makes sense. But when we're talking about roles that cannot work from outside the United States, it is there's a very simple test. When you take your vacation, you're getting paid time off and you're headed out to spend time with your family, you're heading out to travel somewhere, are you able to travel internationally, which by law you have to be allowed to do so. Your employer cannot make you unable to leave the United States. Uh, if you were to travel internationally, do you have a requirement? This would be definitely documented. There's no situation where this would not be documented and very clearly laid out that you absolutely cannot answer questions for work, do any kind of work, uh, in any way contact the office, do anything. Is that clearly documented? Do you actually shut off your phones, stop taking calls, stop answering email, stop receiving email, stop completely? There is zero option for them to reach you beyond the potential to say, hey, there's an emergency, we need you to come back from wherever you are. If you're a defense contractor and you work in those super secure situations, this is how it works. You can still travel internationally. They cannot take that away from you. That is illegal. But if you are able to travel internationally, you're hanging out in Europe, you're down in South America, you're in Southeast Asia, you're enjoying your time on a Thai beach, you're having lots of fun, you're eating loads of noodles, and suddenly they say, oh, there's an emergency. Do they say, we will pay for you to be put on a plane and flown back so you can work? Or do they say, sign in and work from where you are? If it's the former, that indicates you cannot work from abroad and you actually have uh, locational legal frameworks that stop you from doing so. In the other, it is a absolute guarantee, 100% black and white beyond a shadow of a doubt. You absolutely can work from anywhere, no questions ever. If they have the legal right to say without contact, you know, I understand there could be an exception. Well, we called the general and he gave us written permission to let you work from abroad. We're going to fly in equipment for you to connect from whatever. Okay. Like there is a clear, we got an exception around the law kind of approach. Otherwise, if they're just saying, yeah, go ahead and sign in, 
Would you be risking arrest if you followed that instruction? Are they trying to trick you so they can arrest you at the border? If that's like, okay, then that's still illegal, right? Because they're socially engineering you and exposing something so they would get arrested too. But if you are able to do that, you clearly can work from abroad. They expect you to work from abroad when it's convenient for them. So that they're going to not allow you to work from abroad on your terms is purely a manager trying to mess with you. Now, will managers try to mess with you often for personal gain or out of just a hatred of other countries or whatever? Absolutely. A lot of times it's jealousy. They want to work from abroad, but their job is a physical one and they're not able to, so they're gonna punish you as best they can because they don't want you having the freedoms that they don't have. We've all seen that. It is super common in corrupt organizations and mismanaged organizations. You expect middle managers to often do bad things. This is life. So I'm sorry, but there is an amount of control that you have over the situation. So let's talk about this. When you go to your boss, and I was talking to someone who talked to someone, right? So this is secondhand, but we all know these stories, is someone went to their boss and said, hey, I'm interested in working from Nicaragua. Can I do that? And of course they said no, because they're always going to say no. If you say, can I work from HR is always going to tell you no. The purpose of HR is to be a naysayer to everything. If they're not going to get in trouble for saying no, they're always going to say no because their job is to protect the business. They're not going to evaluate the question. They're not going to ask you anything. They're not going to look into it. That costs money and time and takes on risk. So they're just going to say no. That's their job. The reason that they do that is because it's not for you to ask them. It's not on them until you ask, until you pose the question. You're creating the no. So don't ask them. Right? Are you able to work from home? Have you signed an agreement that says you will not leave the United States? If you have, then they can't call you when you're on that beach. You can be like, hey, what are you going to pay me? I can't. I have an agreement. You're trying to trick me into violating our contract. No, I'm not going to do that. Right? So unless you have something that actually prevents you from working, working abroad, you can work abroad. Because U.S. law certainly allows it. Your contract certainly allows it. So why volunteer the information? Why ask the question? Why make a situation that doesn't exist? You already have permission. Use it. Right. So why does it work this way? Okay. So the first thing is context. When you're talking to your friends, you're just talking to your neighbor, you're talking to your buddy, you're having a barbecue, you break and open a beer and they're like, Hey, what are you doing this month? Anything new? Yeah. You know what, Bob? I'm up taking the family. We're moving to Nicaragua. We're going to be sitting on the beach, enjoying life, lower cost of living, higher safety. Life is good. I'm so excited. Oh, are you, what are you doing for work? Oh, well, I have a work from home job. So they won't even know. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I wish we could all do that. I'm super jealous. When you have that conversation, it is understood to Bob that you are simply going to be in Nicaragua. He doesn't assume you're going to be getting residency or citizenship. He doesn't assume you're changing jobs or getting your banks moved or anything like that. He's assuming that the pillow you will be sleeping on will be a Nicaraguan pillow instead of an American pillow. He assumes that your weather will be warm and your view will be the ocean instead of a wheat field and cold blowing snow. That's what he assumes. That's the context of talking to your friends. When you go to the office and you say, I would like to work from Nicaragua, their context is work. Are you going to be working from Nicaragua? Which of course is inaccurate. You're not. You're still working from wherever their office is. You're just going to be living in Nicaragua. That's a completely different thing. That is no business of your employer, except for the cases we've talked about. Even in those, it's not. They don't care where you live. They care where you were, are physically while working. So you could still live in Nicaragua as long as you flew somewhere else during the day, right? Which is ridiculous, but it's an important bit of semantics. No job is legally allowed to care where you live. They're not allowed to ask, except for if they're sending you something, right? <clears throat> it is not within their purview. Just like they're not allowed to force you to tell them your race or your marital status. It's none of their business. They're not allowed to use those things when deciding on hiring you. So when you go to HR or to an employer and say, I want to work from Nicaragua, the context of work from throws everything off because you're not actually working from there. You're just there while working very different things. So we have lots of videos that cover this, but with this context, what they hear is, do we have the legal right to operate and work in Nicaragua? Can we pay you to a Nicaraguan bank? Cause that's where Nicaraguan payments would go and so forth. Things like that, things that are not true and you are not asking, but that's the words you ask. So normal people, when they're dealing with international relocation, often confuse the terminology because they mix the context of talking to your friend where you understand that the conversation is about where you sleep with a conversation with HR where it's understood that the context is where they're sending your check and whose taxes they're going to collect. 
but those are inaccurate things. You're going to, in the case I'm giving, you're an American who's moving to Nicaragua, you're going to continue being an American. You're not giving that up. You're not implying that you're giving that up. No one has suggested giving that up. You're going to keep doing the same job. No one suggested changing that. You're going to continue to do it through the same location that you always have, which is the office, the employer, not your location. Their address is not your house. They do not have insurance on your house. They do not provide the house. They do not pay your electric. I understand in some cases, sometimes they give you a stipend or something, but they're just offsetting your cost. You're still paying it. Never heard of an employer actually paying for your house. And if they do, it's their house, right? As an employer, I'm an employer. I completely have the right to purchase a house and make it a place that my employees can live. It's weird. It's uncommon. Yes, if I did that, that's a slightly different thing, but still I don't have control if they live in it, I can just offer it to them, right? So it's important to understand this context that you're not changing your bank. You're not changing your tax base. You're not changing where you work. You're changing where you live which is no business. If you were moving across town, say you lived in one suburb and you decide you want to move to the other side of town, you're currently on the east side of Minneapolis, you don't go into HR and say, hey, would it be okay if I work from the west side of Minneapolis? Now, most HR departments would understand that you mean you're moving and nothing else is changing. It's just you're getting a new apartment because, I don't know, you got a good deal or you like the view. No big deal because they understand that it's not confusing to them. Or if it is confusing to them, they're only confused by, oh, um, but I'm pretty sure the taxes on the other side of town are the same as this, so it should be fine, right? There's a point at which it's ridiculous to say no, even if they're confused, but they're probably not confused because it's such a simple thing. So you would never say, no, 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 we don't, we don't employ people who live on the west side of Minneapolis. But that's the kind of thing that they, that they're saying that, you know, we're going to not employ you based on where you've decided to have your house. And that makes no sense. And clearly that's not what they intend to say, but given an opportunity, they're definitely going to cover their butts and they're going to default to saying no. They don't want to look into it. They don't want to be liable. No one else is asking, so they don't know what to say. So they're going to say no. So you're, you're guaranteeing an answer by asking a question that's unnecessary, but if you demand an answer, will be negative. So the secrets here are don't be inaccurate. Only state things that are absolutely accurate in the context that you are given. So just like you're talking to someone at a barbecue, you're able to tell them things like, I'm going to be living in Nicaragua or wherever it is you're going to be going. And to your employer, you are still working from the United States because you are. Don't, don't tell them something that's inaccurate because your bank, your payment, your taxes, your work, those are all going to remain American in this example, or Canadian, or wherever you're from, whatever your employer is. And then finally, don't overshare. Don't provide information that's nobody's business to someone who may use it against you. I understand. Sometimes it's difficult to hide your life decisions from people you spend your day working with. Sometimes your employer digs for information. But if you're working from home, there is no requirement for you to be disclosing where that home is, especially as the concept of home is, is ambiguous. So in some cases, you may have a home that you keep in the country that you're from. You may have a family home. You may have an address that you use. There's any number of things that may anchor you as home. So, so we've talked about the context of your employer, and we've talked about the concept of vacationing. So let's expand this a little bit. From the context of the American government, this is a pretty important one if you're an American or Canadian government, if you're Canadian and so forth. You need to have a certain amount of information about what they're going to have as context and what they think is going on. Because you don't want to be doing something illegal on, on that side and you're not trying to you know, not pay your taxes or anything like that. So we need to be accurate. We need to understand these things. But with a good understanding of accuracy, I think you'll find that in most cases, you're very well protected there as well. The government's not out to be punitive just because you're vacationing a lot. We're going to get to that. So let's look at America as an example where this should be broadly applicable. From the position of the United States, if you are traveling, living abroad or whatever, and continuing to work an American job, you are an American paying American taxes, better be paying the American taxes, filing at least, and, and acting as an American with an American bank and all your money is happening in America. So from that perspective, have you left the United States? No. Are you physically outside? Does your passport have a stamp? Sure. But they don't care about that. When we're talking about the IRS, we're talking about state residency, anything like that, they don't care what your passport stamp says. You're an American. You don't lose your American status. You don't stop being an American because you've traveled a certain amount. And this applies to basically every country in the world. They don't take away your citizenship. They don't take away who you are based on 
having a really good long vacation. You don't take a world cruise and suddenly come back with no country to, to go back to. That's not how it works. You don't have to worry about those things. So from an American perspective, unless you're trying to get out of things, you're trying to give up your American citizenship, that's unrelated to this conversation. We're talking about people who are living and working and traveling, not people who are, you know, making a huge point of changing what nationality they are. That will change who you have a right to work for, of course, but it's unrelated to this conversation. So from an American government perspective, nothing changes. And that's not a, they don't know. That's a, this is 100% how the system works. In fact, you do declare to them where you are once you've been there for a little bit of time, once you're, you know, if you're being smart about it, because you want to get there's tax benefits generally in doing so. So at some point you want to make a point of being, I'm not physically in the United States. I'm not using U.S. roads. I'm not using U.S. police. I'm abroad so I can get a discount on this because I'm just not using resources. It's completely reasonable, makes sense, and that's the thing to do. And they will say, excellent, you're not using these resources, so you get a discount. All makes sense. They're actually really good about this. We complain about a lot of American things. This is actually a spot, even though they do a taxing of worldwide income, Honestly, they handle this really well. So you do want them to know. You want to overshare with the U.S. government. Hey, guys, I'm spending a whole bunch of time outside the country, but I'm still working and paying my taxes. Here's my forms, right? <clears throat> because they're going to work with you and, and actually provide a lot of benefits. So th there's a lot of positive here, believe it or not. I'm not saying that paying your taxes is ever a wonderful thing, but they're going to give you so many benefits because you are abroad. You don't want to hide that from them, but you're not living abroad. You are just not in the country, right? It's all about understanding the context of the terminology. Now, from a perspective of Nicaragua, you would be living in the country. They will eventually give you residence or whatever country you're in, right? And some places will give you residence as soon as you arrive or even before you get there, like Mexico. And they, some countries will tax you based on being in the country while working. They have laws that say if you work while in the country, you have to pay taxes. Those exist, so you have to watch out for those or at least be aware of them. In the case of Nicaragua, where I am, where most of you are researching while watching these videos, because that is the context of my, my channel, although we cover as much as we can across Latin America, I am specifically in Nicaragua, and we have a lot of information here that we don't have about other places. Nicaragua does not have a law that taxes you for work you do while in Nicaragua. They only tax you on money that comes from Nicaragua. It's called sourced from Nicaragua, which in this case is not happening. Now, if you're doing an additional thing that's sourcing in Nicaragua, of course, that's gonna have taxes, almost certainly. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a job in the United States where you're being paid in the United States, where you're getting the money in the United States, where you're paying American taxes. And when you go to spend that money in Nicaragua, it's not coming from a paycheck. It's not coming from a third party. It's not coming from a bankroll. It's coming from an ATM withdrawal. It's coming through a transfer from your bank to a Nicaraguan bank. It's coming through maybe a Bitcoin transaction. That'd be unusual, but it's certainly allowed. All those things are personal transfers from you to you. You have a bank in the United States, you can pull out cash in an ATM in Nicaragua. No problem. You have a bank in the United States and a bank in Nicaragua, you're going to have to get paid in the United States, but you can transfer that money to Nicaragua after you've been paid. It is after the taxes are already collected, the income taxes are already collected, then that transfer point is the point at which you personally, moving money from yourself to yourself, do a money laundering uh, check and verification. Now, if it's a small amount of money, doing an ATM withdrawal, the ATM handles it all. Like This is a normal amount of money in a normal transaction, nothing to worry about, nothing to research. If you start pulling a ton of money, phew, I'd really like $50,000 of cash right now, and you move $50,000 from the U.S. to Nicaragua, you can certainly do that. There's no problem there. It's your money. But as with most countries, because it's such a large amount of money, you may have to show provenance. Look, I have it in the United States because it came from my paycheck, or it came from a sale of a house, or it came from uh, investments that, that, that matured or whatever, and uh, uh, capital gains. But as long as you can show that it's your money in the United States, then transferring into Nicaragua won't be any problem. It just has this extra step of paperwork that we call the money laundering process. And it's the not the process of laundering money. It's the process of proving you're not laundering money, just proving that it's your money, but it's your personal money. When a company tries to pay you a large sum of money all at once, they have to show why you're getting this money. Why are they transferring it between them and someone else? But as long as it's you transferring to yourself, it's really easy to show that it's your money. You earned it through some way that's already verified in the United States. So the U.S. 
banking system says, yeah, this is their money. And then when you pull it to Nicaragua, Nicaragua goes, yes, we can show it's coming from their account in the U.S. That's all we need to know. So it's really simple when you do it this way. But if you try to make your employer do that, all kinds of things go wrong. One is it shows you're being paid in Nicaragua, not paid in the U.S. So now you have a question of what taxes do you owe. Now you suddenly may have double taxation. Now you may have Nicaraguan taxes that wouldn't apply before. You may be breaking Nicaraguan employment law, which you weren't breaking before. You may have really complex money laundering uh, uh, provenance problems that come up all the time. Just don't do that. Nobody wants to do that. There's no reason to do that. It's only penalties to do it. Just don't act normally. Don't be weird, and the system just works. It's so simple when you don't overshare or change the meaning of things. And I know there's this compulsion that people have for really obvious reasons to go and declare to people that they're moving to a new country and get approval and, and have everyone sign off on it, but it doesn't make sense and it just creates problems and you're almost guaranteed to say something wrong and nobody is going to take the risk of correcting you or signing off on misinformation that you provided. They're just not going to, it's not a risk any employer is going to take. So as long as you put it on yourself, then it's up to the employer to come up with a way to be unhappy with you doing everything right, if they even find out about it. And if they do find out about it, they can just not say anything and not cause problems. So there's a lot of incentive on both sides for you to act correctly, it just makes sense. Now, in talking about this, you may have picked up on something if you were paying close attention. When we talked about Nicaragua, they understand that you are probably a resident, but not necessarily. So what do they consider you if what do they consider you if they are not considering you a resident? That's the first question. The second question is the United States considers you to be American, working in America, doing American things, getting paid in America, but they know in most cases that you're not physically in America. So what's going on there? What do they consider you? And the answer to both of these things is the same thing. And I think it clarifies everything when you realize that this is what's going on. Now, from the Nicaraguan perspective, this is a temporary thing. They consider you to be this until you become a resident. From an American perspective, they consider you to be this forever until you return. But if you never return, then they consider you this forever. And what is that thing? That thing is a complicated term that we in the industry use. Now, I know this is jargon, but brace yourself. It's an important bit of jargon that you're going to want to know. You're known as a tourist. So, as a tourist, America recognizes, as most countries do, that their citizens will travel around the world. And yes, I'm being super dry. Just a normal tourist, like we say every day. People overlook this because they layer on assumptions and inappropriate terms on top of a very simple action, the action of traveling, of being a tourist. You're not becoming a citizen of Nicaragua. You're not giving up your citizen, citizenship in the United States. You're not doing any of these dramatic things. You are traveling for a long time. Really quickly, if we go back to Europe in, say, the 1700s, it was absolutely normal for a well-to-do British citizen to say, you know, turn 20, have some spare money, want to educate themselves uh, and broaden their worldview, they would go on what was known as the Grand Tour of Europe, and they would go for somewhere between six months and two years and travel around Europe, often spending a long time in Paris, commonly Vienna, maybe a bit of time in Madrid or Rome, Berlin, um, Amsterdam. Right. These areas, it was common to stay for months, establish an apartment, do grocery shopping, make friends, attend parties, hang out with other expats, but also hang out with locals, study language, museums, art, take classes, do all kinds of things, go dancing. Um, and often it was a chance to meet other people in a similar uh, life position, uh, and it was a, a great time to potentially um, make friends for business in the future, make connections that may just help you in your political or military life. A lot of people went into military service back then, or possibly, you know, find a potential suitor. Uh, it would not be uncommon to either meet someone that would be a great life partner, or probably more likely meet the family of someone who might be a great life partner and be introduced. But that was a very common thing. So the idea that you would travel for up to years at a time was an absolutely normal thing even in the era of not being able to work remotely or not meaningfully be able to work remotely. This is built into the concept of being a tourist. We often now, because the average American and the average meaning the entire bell curve, uh, 
assumes that vacations are limited to fewer than four weeks per year and often less than two weeks at a shot because employers just won't let you go for very long. So sorry, we just, we don't let you do that, right? Not all employers, I know for a fact as an employer that we allow much longer periods of time off from work as a standard thing. In fact, we often encourage it because it's good for the team to learn to work without key resources and it's good for key resources to really unwind and unload the burdens of working life. So it's a great combination in many cases, but a lot of employers don't like to give lots of time off. So Americans really have this idea that vacations are a one to two week activity, very rarely going internationally and often rushed, right? It's, a, it's all about compressing time because we work really long hours, but much of the world still has longer vacation times, France especially, and the idea that you can travel is still built into the mindset and legalities of everything. You don't stop being a tourist just because you went for more than two weeks or more than four weeks. So this is what's actually happening under the hood. From an American perspective, you are in this case, we're using Nicaragua, but any country could be the example. You are simply traveling to Nicaragua. You are completely able to uh, rent a hotel, get an Airbnb, rent a short-term apartment, rent a long-term apartment, buy a house, buy a business. All of those are things that you're completely legally then kind of expected to do while on vacation. Not every vacation would you buy a business, but you understand the idea. It is a normal thing for people who are traveling to be interested in starting a business. People do it all the time as normal travelers who are only going for, say, a month or so. Maybe they go back to the same place year after year, and over a period of time, they decide that they're going to start a business there or own a house that they go back to all the time. Snowbirds do this famously. So this idea that you are just a tourist on an open-ended trip is absolutely normal. And Almost all people who are doing this will return to the United States on a semi-regular basis. Even I, who go back to the United States very little, still go back generally at least once a year, often twice. I keep my time under the 30-day limit so that I'm still seen as not being tax resident in the United States. It's not exactly the right term, but you look at the video we have on foreign earned income exclusion, and that will explain what I mean. Uh, I want to make sure I'm still getting those benefits. You don't want to miss that by a day kind of thing. Uh, so we're almost always coming back, at least from time to time. Um, and so your, your travels stop and then restart again. So they see it as just one vacation after another. You just take really long vacations. Retirees would do this really commonly. Uh, it's not uncommon for someone who's retired or somewhere retired to take months or even years on a vacation. And we know that there's people doing global uh, cruises now, which are nine to 18 months. Well, obviously you're just a tourist. You're not establishing yourself somewhere at all. It's pure travel for that time. So of course the United States is going to see you as a tourist. And if you spend all that time in one little village in Nicaragua or on a cruise ship going from port to port around the world, one, the United States doesn't track that or care. Two, it's all the same to them. It's 100% just you're a traveler outside the United States. What you do with your time is completely up to you. That's your private time. It's not the business of your employer or the government to track that. Now there's activities you're not allowed to do overseas and they'll try to track that. But as long as you're being legal, then they don't care whether you're spending your time sitting on a beach or climbing mountains or writing code. You're allowed to do all those things equally and encouraged to do so because you're still contributing to the American economy and tax base, but you're out of their hair, which they kind of like. So there's some benefits for them as well, them being the country or the government, however you want to look at it. So from the American perspective, you're just a tourist. From the Nicaraguan perspective, you start as a tourist. Now that could last for days or months or even years. And eventually, if you don't go anywhere else and you just stay in Nicaragua, they're going to expect you to convert to residency. We got lots of videos that talk about this process. So we don't need to go into that. The point is up until you achieve residency, which for me took about three years. For some people, I've seen it take three or four weeks, more typically several months. And I've seen some people take many years longer than me. It all depends. And in some cases they have extenuating circumstances, some paperwork's lost. And Nicaragua's good about, oh, paperwork problems, just stay as a tourist until we figure it out. So that worked out for them. Didn't really cause a hassle. Some people panic about that. Like, well, what if it took that long? Well, what if, right? You get to stay during the time before then. Anyway, it's not really a big problem. So uh, up until you achieve residency, you are a tourist here. You're literally on a automatic, no paperwork, 
tourist visa. That's what's happening under the hood. And you can stay either 90 days or 180 days at a time, depending on how you do your extensions. Uh, and then you just have to do border runs. And so they see it as being a tourist who leaves and comes back as well. This is really, really, really well established that you are a tourist. Uh, it's simply an American mentality and a few other places feel like once you're getting a certain type of rental and an Airbnb is seen as still being a traveler and a hotel is seen as still being a traveler, but renting an apartment is seen as becoming a resident and people start to think, well, I'm, I'm now I'm not a tourist, right? And, and to your friends in Nicaragua, right? People will ask us, oh, are you tourists here? No, 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 we live here, we invest here, we own homes here, so we're not tourists here. And that's legit from a human perspective, but from a government perspective, until just recently, we were tourists. We still have complete freedom to leave. We are still tourists from the United States perspective. We did not establish residency. Now we have residency, so now from all perspectives in Nicaragua, we are not tourists. And from all perspectives in the United States, we are travelers who have left the United States. So we are still tourists from the American perspective, residents from the Nicaraguan perspective. Residency is something that is internal to a country. Whether Nicaragua considers us residents or not has absolutely nothing to do with the American viewpoint of us being residents, non-residents, or tourists. To America, we are American residents who are travelers uh, at any given moment, right now being one of those moments. That perspective will change your world when it comes to how you look at business because you are simply a work from home person who is traveling while working from home. Now I understand there is a difference between working uh, and traveling while you are on paid time off and just helping out and when you are officially at work. There are some leniencies for problems when you're traveling. So you do want to be aware of, uh, and I've done this, right? I spent a long time working from home and being a full-time traveler, meaning I literally was bouncing from place to place for a long period of time. During that time, I would have disruptions in my internet. I'd have lots of time zone problems. I had a lot of complications that came from that. But because my employer was on board with that process, it wasn't an issue. Um, but if you're doing that and you're trying to hide what you're doing and act like you have a stable work environment and you're guaranteeing you're going to provide a stable work environment and then are unable to do so, that can create problems of its own. But those problems are from your logistics, not from the fact that you're actually in different countries or jurisdictions all the time. So it's it's all about understanding the context of the conversations. And I understand when you're doing this and it's your first time, it does get complex and it's easy to get confused. But taking a moment, realizing that we tend to emotionally alter the conversation in a negative way. We tend to layer on things we should not layer on. We tend to say things that are not necessarily true or not true in the context that we're saying them. They are not true to the listener, even if they're true to the speaker. And uh, we overshare information that's nobody's business and create a situation where they feel they have to shut us down and not approve something when in reality it is not theirs to know or to approve or to be privy to. There's no reason for that. So with this context of understanding that you are a tourist, that that is truly what you are, no matter how you want to personally define yourself from a personal perspective, from a legal perspective, you are a tourist. And when your business asks you, well, are you going to be at your house? No, I'm, I'm traveling. Oh, okay. How long are you going to be there? I don't know. Right? Where are you going? I don't know. I'm just a wanderer. Right? And, and legitimately, you can leave any time. You can't guarantee that you're not going to leave Nicaragua. So why do you have to guarantee anything? Right, it doesn't make sense. So it's all about context. It's all about this accuracy. So I'm, I'm hoping that this is a useful tool that we've put together for you. I end every video with I'm hoping. I've really realized I've probably said that in excess of 1,800 times now, uh, but. Truly, I hope that this is a useful explanation of the context around remote work and why people trigger problems that don't need to exist and why I would say easily 90% of the people who can work abroad believe that they can't or have created situations blocking them where they've disclosed something they shouldn't and now they've been told they can't and now it's a matter of arguing or defying a, a an order and while your business may not have the right to tell you no, it's going to be very difficult to actually go out and and defy what they've said, now you're in a position of being antagonistic. They're already antagonistic with you, but you've already kept the job. So that antagonism is kind of past. Now, if you're going to counter with additional antagonism, sure, they could ignore it over time, they could choose to, but often employers are looking for excuses to shed people. Don't give them one unnecessarily. So 
just don't trigger the situation in the first place. But when you are looking for future jobs, or you're dealing with this down the road, just make sure that you are uh, making it clear that you're going to work from home and that you're not guaranteeing where home is. And that's generally as far as it needs to go. If you need to provide a fast internet connection, good working environment, your own computer, whatever, uh, no problem. American bank account, American residency addresses, no problem. None of those things are implied by you traveling. None of those are, are implied by you taking up residence abroad. You are simply a long-term traveler who is currently making up their mind as to where they want to go, and it's indefinite. And if you think about this from another perspective, if they were okay with you being in Nicaragua for a week while you're on vacation, well, two weeks because you stayed a little bit longer, suddenly a month, now it's six months, even if there is a, but we don't want you working from Nicaragua, well, but you've been okay with it for this long, why is it becoming a problem in the future? Has it been a problem? Well, no, you've demonstrated that it works really well. Okay, so you're looking to just sabotage the company. Why, what is going to trigger a problem in the future, especially as months turn into years? And then at some point it becomes really ridiculous to worry about it and be like, no, 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 you can't work there even though you've been working there and we've established this. So this is also a situation and this is completely separate, but it's a situation where getting forgiveness because you've done nothing wrong. So it's not really forgiveness, but dealing with the problem later instead of triggering one up front. Because if you say it up front, they have an opportunity to say no. But if you do it later, they have to be in a really rough position of saying, oh, we accidentally permitted this and we didn't mean to. Well, that's on them. Now they're creating a problem. And if they fire you for that, that potentially creates a lot of problems. They didn't tell you no. They didn't give you guidance that you weren't allowed to do it. So you took your default. You're allowed to move to the other side of Minneapolis. You're allowed to move to a different state, of course you can move to a different country. As a tourist, you're just traveling. You were okay with it when you needed me to work when I was on vacation, so I have to be okay with it. So you have to be okay with me being somewhere else when I'm not on vacation. That's how it works. It's a two-way street. And so watch out for companies who are going to make false claims, but don't put them in a position of feeling that they need to. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Just, and the link is down in the description, of course. And ask your questions. Scroll down in there. Ask questions. Send in video questions if you can. That's fantastic. Make sure they're horizontal and 30 frames per second, if at all possible. We do have a new member group for people who want to do a long-term support of the channel. And uh, as always, I'll see all of you tomorrow.